I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Dear Lord, I want to thank you so much for answering my prayers. I'm in a room with over a hundred men. I'm in a room with over a hundred men. Oh Lord, good Lord, thank you. Okay. <laughs> my name is Lynette Cardi, and it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight and I'm sure that my sisters in the audience will say, oh, oh, this is a good room to be in, isn't it? These men are looking dapper, aren't they? So many of them, right? Clap for them. I feel like a girl waiting to get in the double dutch row. Just... I'm ready. And men, put your hands together for these women. Don't they look gorgeous tonight? They're in silk and satin and lace and you know some of you don't got on enough fabric. But it's okay. I want to thank those of you that noticed that I dropped some weight. And yes, I did it all by running on the treadmill, pretending that I was running after a man and he was running from me. I just running and running and running. So ladies, I want to help you out tonight. Look at these men, really, really look at these men all suited up in front of you. There is nothing like a man that is suited up. Put your hands together for them. Right, I feel like saying, Hercules, Hercules, Hercules! They are gorgeous. I remember seeing the, uh, the shy guy that I have a little crush on for the first time all suited up. And all I can say is, I felt like I needed a sandwich and a cigarette. He looked good. So, for those of you that are looking for a date, I'm going to help you tonight. Because <clears throat> I was anxious like that a long time ago. Just wanted to date a guy. I mean, I was so anxious. I remember I was waiting in line at the supermarket, and this man bumped into me. <laughs> I turned around. I was like, I hope you know we go together now. <laughs> and if you bump into one, me one more time, you're going to have to come meet my daddy. So, but in all seriousness, we are here for philanthropy. And... Um, we're here because the, the proceeds from this will be enabling young boys to attend the Connecticut Science Center's summer program, and I just think that is awesome. It is awesome. One of the people that I most look up to in television um, is not because of what she does in television. It's actually because of what she gives back to the community, and that's Oprah. I'm always amazed at um, everything that she's done. She's given away money and homes and vacations and an education to a whole group of girls in Africa. And so I'm hoping one day that maybe I'll be able to do that. But the one thing that um, I was really surprised about was when, and some of you probably saw it, was when Oprah said, came out to the audience, all just calm. And she pointed at everybody, she said, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. That was amazing. It was amazing. I was home and my heart was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I got a car. You know, it was you, so I got a car. So, Oprah, if you can just peek in on this tonight. All of us single girls, we want to hear you say what we really want to hear one day. We really want to hear you say. You get a man, you get a man, you get a man, you get a man. So, ladies, those of you that are single, take out your cell phones. Oh, I'm not joking. Take out your cell phones, put it on camera. All you single men, raise your hands. 
There's one right there. I saw the cheating on the steps. Raise your hands, all you single men. Keep your hands up if you got a job. Keep your hand up if you believe in a higher being. Keep your hand up if you put the toilet seat down. Ladies, get your pictures. Everybody got their pictures? So what I'm really hoping for is that at some point, maybe next year or the year after, a couple will approach me and they will say, you know what? We met the night of the 100th of color event because I put my hand up and she came looking for me afterwards. And we danced and we went out and we were married. And we have a child that we named after you. <laughs> and I'll be so proud. So that'll be my lollipop moment. So I hope everyone mingles afterwards. But in all seriousness, we're here tonight. We're gathered here tonight to honor the brilliant, the captivating, the dazzling, funny, stoic, and simply wonderful men of color. Men who were either born here or abroad that quietly do men's work day to day, day in, day out, diligently and sometimes without compensation. We thank you. Gentlemen who are understated, who are at times overlooked, yet they soar below the radar. Men who serve as mentors and whether they know it or not, they inspire and they nurture us as they share their knowledge and their wisdom. Distinguished men who give from the heart, both professionally and personally. Those that are bursting with book knowledge and those that are bursting with life experience. We are elated to honor those in a litany of fields from human services, education, artists, law, law enforcement, medicine, social services, military, entertainment, corporate professionals, civic leaders, religious leaders, media, firemen, politicians, and entrepreneurial businessmen. We thank you, gracias, for all that you have done for your family, friends, colleagues, and even strangers as you leave your own signature in making the world a better place. Congratulaciones to all of you wonderful men. You leave a special love-filled congratulations on behalf of my siblings as well, to our family, to our dad, Edwin Carney. Please join me in clapping for these wonderful men. Next up to the mic is a wonderful reverend. She is new here in Connecticut. And um, she's starting a new church, her and her husband. But I understand that in order to join their church, that there's this little rule that she has. So three couples come to her, and they want to join the church. And she tells them, you must abstain for at least a month. The three couples say, we can do that. And they go away. After a month, the three couples come back. The first couple was married for 25 years. And the husband approached the pastor and he said, Pastor, we knew we could do it. I slept on the sofa the entire time. She says, welcome to my church. The second couple had been married for 10 years. And the husband said, Pastor, we thought we could do it. But by the third night, I knew it was going to be difficult. So I went and I slept on the sofa. We made it. She says, welcome to my church. The third couple was a newlywed couple. Both of them approached the pastor, both of them with their heads down. The husband said, pastor, we tried. You know we're newlyweds. The first night, it was OK. The second night, it was tough, but it was OK. But by the third night, she decided she wanted to paint. She bent over to pick up a can of paint. I became filled with desire for her. And we made love right there on the spot. The pastor said, well, you know, you won't be able to join my church. They said, we know. 
and we won't be able to go back in Home Depot anymore either. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Reverend Miguelina Howell. Just for the record, that story is not me. <laughs> She's talking about another pastor. <laughs> it is a blessing to be here this evening to say the opening prayer. It is a blessing to be celebrating a hundred men of color who have made an impact in society and in this area. I firmly believe that the Lord placed Mr. June's Archer's heart to celebrate them. We need to tell our stories. Our younger generations need to hear the positive and strong forces that our people of color represent in society. We have to hear the story. And I invite you, June, to keep dreaming. Keep dreaming so our kids can see examples like this evening. And keep dreaming so we may be here next year celebrating a hundred women of color. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We praise you, we worship you. We give you thanks for the life and contributions of each one of the hundred men that we're honoring this evening. We ask upon your blessing for each one of the individuals in this room. Continue to encourage us onward, to live in the midst of a society that do not recognize always our strength, our gifts, our talents. We give you thanks this evening. We ask you to be upon us this evening we ask you, O oh Lord, that we may celebrate and rejoice and enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we have a fabulous opera singer with us, and she's going to share her beautiful voice. So please put your hands together for Shantice. I wanted to say the Lord's Prayer because I thought it would be the best appropriate thing to say for these gentlemen, and I hope that you enjoy.
share this with you because it's a true story. And the next gentleman I'm about to bring up is all about education and making sure that kids have an equitable education, equal access for all children, but especially for children of color and English language learners. So speaking of English language learners, my brother and his fiance, who is Russian, have a little boy, his name is Logan. And Logan is two years old, so he is navigating four languages, right? He's navigating Russian, English, Spanish, and Fuyunlu culture, Jamaica Patois. <laughs> so I got all excited. You know, they live in North Carolina now. She brought him home, and I'm playing with him. And I brought him this toy, which is a huge computer, and it has the alphabet. And it says the alphabet in English and in Spanish. It says the letter, it pronounces the letter, it has a word that starts with each letter. She's very proud, so he opens the gift and he's very excited. She stands up and she says, he knows his letters. And I said, well, he's two, and he might know the alphabet, but he probably doesn't know letter recognition. She says, I tell you, he knows his letters. <laughs> so the teacher and me is gonna test him, right? So Logan, give me your baby. What's that letter? And so he looks at the letter. He says, it's the hardest letter for a two-year-old. He says, double Jew. And I was like, it was a W. <laughs> okay, well, what's this letter? G. She says, I told you, he knows his letters. <laughs> so we're talking, and sure enough, he gets restless, and he starts to cry, and he's kind of rolling on the ground and screaming and wilding out. So she stands over him, and she says, I tell you, I don't like what you learn in the daycare. You learn this tampon tantrum in the daycare. I said, excuse me? She says, he learns the tampon tantrum in the daycare. I said, no, it's, it's temper tantrum, not actually tampon tantrum. She says, oh, I see the bad word? Yeah, it's, it's not the right word. Not the right word. She says, don't tell your brother. He will be mad at me. I said, my brother never gets mad. My brother's out there somewhere. Where are you? Where are you? Where's he? My brother's out there. He never gets mad. I said, why would you get mad? She says, we had big meeting at work. 80 people in meeting. In meeting, we pass ball. You must say when you get ball what happened in your life before we start the meeting. Ball come to me. I don't want to speak. My English not good. So I say, same thing man in front of me say. I say, dildo. <laughs> she said, what? I said, dildo. I said, you know. She says, I know now, it's ditto. <laughs> yeah, it's ditto. And you're right, Logan doesn't need this. You need this. <laughs> Join me in putting your hands together for our own Hartford mayor, Pedro Sega. Welcome. What a, you know, I had some prepared remarks, and when I got to the Science Center, I am so moved that there's just no possible way I can read anything. Anything. Before you, you have a collection of 100 of Hartford's and Connecticut's finest. These are men which I have had the pleasure of serving, working with, out in the community. I've um, had disagreements with some of them. <laughs> but we've always respected each other. And when we had disagreements, we found out that it was only the best way to come up with the best solution. And we've not been disrespectful. So I'm very honored to be here, to welcome you. I must confide that it was supposed to have been 101 men of color. And um, I have nothing to do with the decision to trim it down to 100. So David Chappelle, if you're listening, I had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Nothing. And I must say that giving the people who have been visiting the president of North Korea, especially basketball players, and we know that all these people in the Hollywood and in the entertainment field are connected, so I've, um, I'm going to have the city council, Mr. Anderson, authorize an uh, expense paid trip to North Korea so I myself could speak to the president of North Korea and make sure that the city of Hartford is safe. 
How's that? Again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for putting this. This means so much to our city, to our community. We have lost an incredible amount of men of color to different tragedies. We've lost them to prisons, we've lost them to racism, we've lost them to indifference. And to get to a point where we can just have a group of men sitting here, and I want the young people who are here, because we know there's a lot of young people that are here, to look at this group of men. Collectively, they represent, I figured it out, based on an average service of 20 years as a hundred, is over 2,000 years of service to our people in different fields. So this is no more small feat, no small undertaking. This is what the spirit of our community is. This is what the spirit of our community should be. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Thank you to the organizers. And I hope, I hope that we can continue to assemble hundreds, thousands of men and women of color. Let me tell you, for each person that is here, we have a lot of unsung heroes in our communities. People who might share their groceries with their neighbor, who look out after their neighbor, who protect each other, who do wonderful things for each other. That's not to minimize the impact that these men have had, but that goes to tell you that that's what I want our young people to see. And oftentimes, unfortunately, our media doesn't portray the best images of men of color. So again, thank you. Congratulations. I love all of you. Thank you for your work, and let's move forward together. If we move forward together, we can get things done. Thank you. The brainchild and balancing backbone of this event is a young man who has no bar for bite. He is bona fide, brotherly, and bold. He is known to blazon the trail, so brace yourself for this busy, brainy, butter-voiced baritone, who was none other than the face of Hot Chocolate Soul events, those multicultural, multi-talented showcases that occur at the Bushnell. He is also an entrepreneur with his 1128 Entertainment Group. He's also an A&R consultant, and he's more popularly known for his group, Room Service. And like the name implies, Room Service, he handles all things with special delivery. He is the master at constantly anticipating needs, helping others, and finding the void, filling it, both personally and professionally. He sees every obstacle as a stepping stone, and he steps up on it to see a clear path to his goals. This lifestyle and motivational speaker is also an author. He has taken his daily inspirations from social media to his newest publication. Yes, every day can be a good day. So, perceive the perennial perfectionist who preserves past power plays. With a pen and a pad, he proved that perseverance and purpose pays off. This perpetually polite pal is particularly patient, paced, and precise. He's a patriarch that has pooed patrons and pennies from panels, parties, and parks. He's a popular podium pleaser who praises people with pledges and plaques. So pound your palms passionately for Jim and <laughs> so much. Please sit down. I'm, I'm going to be brief. I want to first start off by saying uh, welcome and I apologize for the uh, the door. We thought it would be a great idea but it is an awesome idea and we hope that you guys bear with us and be patient. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the evening so thank you so much and give yourself a round of applause. This idea came from uh, years ago of just 
at least each of these men have been a mentor to me. Some of them I've, I've met for the first time, but the majority of them have been a mentor. And I felt that in our community in this life and times, young men need to see examples of men of color who wear their pants around their waist and a belt around their waist and know how to be a gentleman. So I'm going to make it brief because I want to make sure we have a great time. I didn't want this to be a three-hour Grammy award ceremony. But gentlemen, I thank you. I honor you. And I hope that we can inspire another generation, the next generation. And we hope to have men that throughout the whole state, from Stanford to Springfield, is where we look. And we hope that we continue to raise up and inspire. Um, so thank you so much. And you guys... Email us, let us know who you'd like to recognize. It is open. The criteria is that there is no criteria. The CEO, as well as the, the corner store owner who's been serving a generation, or three, four generations, should be recognized. So this is not a race to the finish line. It's to make sure that we continue to inspire many, many others. Um, I know that we have a proclamation here. Uh, Governor Malloy couldn't make it, but you guys will see it in the booklet that we have here, and Mayor Segaro has a proclamation as well that we will be getting to all of the, the men. Um, I don't know if you want to read it really quickly, or we'll just, you could bring it up. Today in the city of Hartford is 100 Men of Color Day. I hereby proclaim along with the members of the city of Oh, here it is. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you for supporting it. So we're going to get into uh, the keynote speaker. And this gentleman uh, I met by phone about a year ago. And from the day we met, we, were, we met in downtown uh, Manhattan. And we were walking. He had an event. And we ended up walking about 30 blocks until he said to me, I have some place to be and speak in about five minutes. I have no idea where, where I am. And I told him, no worries, we'll get there. But the conversation was so awesome and inspiring that that day, I think that both of us have been learning a lot of things. And I'm going to let him come and, and bless us. But we have a lot of work to do. He and I, we're doing some great things. And he's doing great things. And I'm learning from him. And on Sundays, you can hear the music that I'm putting together with his voice on Sunday NFL Countdown on ESPN for the whole football season. So you NFL fans, if you're up at 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, we're going to be inspiring NFL fans um, with the word and a couple of inspirational things. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Hartford, Springfield, New Haven welcome to Mr. Eric Thomas. So I just I thank you guys 
for this opportunity and just allow me before I actually um, speak about what I came to speak about. I remember a lady came to me a, about three months ago and she told me three months from today your career is going to take off to a whole other level. And, you know, people prophesy all the time. I'm like, okay, where did you get that from? But when I walked in the room today, I realized what she was talking about. Uh, that's three months ago when she said that to me. So, again, this, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you guys for what you've done. Please just give me You know, I was trying to think about, um, you know, what, what I wanted to say to on uh, this group. And again, like I said, I had no idea I was addressing you, uh -huh, so I'm going to have to switch everything up. <laughs> um, but I, I thought about when I was about, I, I guess I might have been about 21, 22 years old. And it was the Time Magazine. And the story on Time Magazine was a young man they called Yummy. And I remember I was in college at the time, and I was excited. You know, I'm a high school dropout, you know, so um, to be able to get my GED and go to college, I mean, that was huge. You know, my grandfather is a high school dropout. My father is a high school dropout. And when I dropped out, it was just a part of the culture. It's what we do. My grandfather had five kids by five different women. My father had five or six kids. When we say five, but there's another one we found out that's out there. So um, it's, it's just a history of failure. And um, when I got my GED and went to college, I was so excited just about getting out of Detroit. You know, I was so excited about this opportunity to kind of start my life all over again. And so the, the first thing I want to say uh, to you men, and I know you've accomplished so much, but I want to say to you, and I say it again respectfully, um, that your work is not done, uh, that your work is not done. I remember being 17 years old, and I remember going to church for the first time. My mother um, got pregnant with me at 17 years old, and like I said, my biological father, for whatever reason, I wasn't in my life. And so I remember uh, my mother marrying, and I didn't have a great relationship with um, the person she married. I always tell my mom that that was your husband, not my father. Um, and although you wanted him to be my father, I didn't have a choice in the matter, and so we never really had an emotional attachment. And so unfortunately, like so many young men, uh, I went the wrong direction. I remember when I went to church for the first time, um, this is why we need you first and foremost for hope and for uh, uh, belief and for inspiration. I'll never forget the pastor came to me when I was 17 years old in a high school dropout. And he said to me, young man, have you finished school? And I said, no, sir. He was a military man. He said, have you finished school? I said, no, sir. He said, why haven't you finished school? And I said, well, well, well we don't do school in my family. <laughs> and I remember coming back to church the next week, and he said, son, are you in school? And I said, I told you last week, sir, I wasn't in school. And he said, I need you to do me a huge favor, young man. I, I need you to get your GED, and I need you to go to college. I said, sir, no disrespect, but you're a pastor. No disrespect. But that's what you're supposed to do, like, that's your job. You're supposed to encourage people. He said, no, you don't get it, young man. You, you, I've been watching you, and you have a gift. You have an anointing on you. Now, my, mind you, he's talking to a 17-year-old who's sleeping in abandoned buildings and who got kicked out of school. But he's saying to me, you have a gift. And what I need you to do is I need you to get your GED, and I'm going to send you to college. I'm like, I don't know what college you're going to send me to, but uh, I'm a high school dropout. And I love it, I love it, I love it. And what I'm asking you to do for me, and I, I know it's difficult sometimes when we're dealing with this particular generation. I run a retention program on the campus of Michigan State University, and it seems like every year the, the mentality of students are getting worse. It seems like it's getting worse, and the apathy is getting worse, and the laziness is getting worse. But the thing I love about Pastor is every week I would come to church, he would say, boy, did you get your GED? Like, he held me accountable when I couldn't spell accountability. But every week, he kept asking me, son, did you get your GED? And I said, no, I didn't get my GED. I told you last week. I told you the week before that. And I told you the week before that I didn't get no GED. And I don't plan on getting no GED. But he never stopped. We must never stop. As hopeless as it seems, we must never stop. And week in and week out, he kept saying, did you get your GED? And I said, no, sir. And then he, he put the first lady on me. 
I like the first lady because the first lady's approach was a little different. He was a military man, but the first lady would give me a hug and a kiss, and she didn't call me by my name. She called me baby. <laughs> she said, baby, did you get your GED? I said, no, ma'am. She gave me a kiss. She said, I love you. Go get your GED. And week after week after week after week, having a strained relationship with my mother. She didn't know it, but like a heavyweight fighter, she was wearing me down. And I'll never forget about six months after I said no, when I said no to her this time, it felt like I was letting her down. We had established a relationship, and that relationship, it, 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 it penetrated, and it hurt. And I said, you know what? I can't, I can't keep telling the lady no. And as fate would have it, I started dating a young lady at the church. And the young lady told me, I'm finishing high school, and I'm not dating no high school dropout. When I go to college, if you don't come with me, I'm breaking up with you. And the kid went and studied past his GBA. <laughs> and listen to me, I've been married for that, with that young lady for 23 years. <laughs> and so so what, I'm, what I'm asking you to do, when, I'm, when I saw the story of Yummy, what happened for me, when I, when I saw that story, I'm originally from Chicago, Southside, and when I saw the story of Yummy, an 11-year-old in a gang in Chicago that had been executed, had been murdered execution style, 11 years old. 11 years old. And so what happened for me, because the pastor was more than a pastor, but he was a man. Now, I say this with all due respect, is this meeting is so important tonight because there are a lot of individuals who have the title, but they don't represent the brand. Now listen to me, this is important, this is important. Guys, and, 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 and I, I can't be what you are at this particular point in my life, and I don't say this in a disrespectful manner, but there are people like Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Like my grandmother, I, I don't know, I, I wasn't alive when Martin Luther King was alive, but he must have been some kind of man. Because when I would come in, grandma would always have that picture of Jesus, and she had that picture of Martin Luther King. <laughs> I mean, every time I would come in, Grandma would have, and I asked myself today, if Grandma was alive, some of the leaders that we have today, would Grandma have them next to Jesus and Martin Luther King? I'm not talking about a title. I'm not talking about the title that America gives us. I'm not talking about a degree. I'm talking about my grandmother had respect for Dr. Martin Luther King, respect for Marcus Garvey, respect for uh, Malcolm X. My grandmother had respect, and she would have pictures in her walk. And so, 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 Guys, you got to do me a huge favor. You have to expose what you're doing right here in this room. You have to expose it to the youngies of the world. Because I'll be honest, the reason why Eric Thomas was who Eric Thomas was at that particular juncture in my life is because I didn't have a model. But Pastor Willis became that model for me, and he willed me to get my GED, and he sent me to a historically black university that changed my life forever, guys. I'm asking you, as, 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 as difficult as it is, as we're dealing with some of these young people in this society, I'm asking you to do me a huge favor. I'm asking you not to give up. I'm asking you not to give up on them. I'm asking you not to give up on our young men who seem hopeless. I'm asking you to visit the prisons. With all the work that I do, I still go to the prisons. And I still tell young people, like, when you come out, we need you to really be reformed. Like, this is not a time just to be in prison to sit. Martin Luther King came through here. Malcolm came through here. And when Malcolm came out, he came out a totally different person. This is your opportunity. We need you. We need you to be present. We need to see you. We need to hear you. Because when we hear you and we see your example, guess what? We change. Okay, and so I've only been given so much time, so I have to tell you how we change. So, so I went from Detroit, Michigan. I went from being a high school dropout. And I went to a historically black university, and, and, I, and I, I, it blew my mind when I got to campus. It was the first time in my life. See, I'm from Detroit, right? Guys, they did, they did GM and Chrysler and Ford, and you didn't necessarily have to wear a suit to do that. And so when I got to college for the first time, I saw African-American men dressed up at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. <laughs> now, you got to hear what I'm telling you. You said, well, Eric, are you saying you've never seen suits? I'm from Detroit. I've seen suits. We talking like orange, right? <laughs> Royal blue, right? With the gators, right? I mean, I'm talking about a whole other look when I went to college. 
and, and, and what, I, what I see in Barack Obama and this generation, I saw young men dressed up like that in college. I was exposed. And I heard it for the first time in my life. Young men not only dressed up, but at the breakfast table talking about Plessy versus Ferguson. In Brown versus Board of Education, I had never heard that language before. And so what was happening was that person that the pastor saw in that environment was coming alive. That guy who I didn't even know exists, that guy started to come alive. And so we went from that GED. We went from that uh, to the four-year degree. And then we went on a fellowship to Michigan State and got a master's. Now we're in the last phase of a dissertation for a PhD. Why? Because somebody believes in me. Somebody believes in me and nobody else believes in me. And so listen to me. I need you to do me a favor. When the Detroit public school system said, it's over for this kid. When the prison system said, you got one more strike. When my mother cried and said, I don't know what else to do with you. Some male, some man came to me and said, kid, you have greatness in you, and I'm going to make it my responsibility to bring that out of you. So, so why is modeling so important? Now, I need you to do me a huge favor, guys. We, you know, you made it, and now I need you to come back and give us the blueprint. We need the blueprint. We need the blueprint. They, I, in the community, our kids need the blueprint. I'm an example. So what happened? What happened was I went to college, and I didn't, I didn't know any better, but being from Detroit, I'm real good with deductive reasoning. And I noticed that the professor was getting paid and he wasn't coming to every class. I said, what kind of job is this? <laughs> I, I, I want this kind of job. I'm from Detroit. My mother worked at Ford for 30 years. You don't get paid unless you clock in and clock out. And I started asking, where is this professor and who is this young person? They said, that's a TA, a teacher's assistant. So I said, where is the professor? They said, well, he's lecturing. I'm like, wow, he's getting paid to talk. Like, that guy is boring. So then I start asking the question, how is it that this guy gets paid not to be here and he's getting another check? That's two checks. <laughs> that's, that's multiple streams of income. <laughs> and so they explained to me what happens is he's published. I said, oh, okay, he's published. That's why he's not here. I'm going to be honest with you. When I first heard the term, I had never heard it. In Detroit, West Side 8 Mile, I've never heard anybody published before. So when I asked one of my friends, black guy, what, what, what's published mean? He said it means he does research and he wrote a book. I said, oh, he wrote a book. They said, yeah, he gets special treatment because he wrote a book. Because I got in the environment. <laughs> Listen to me, I, I said it humbly. I said it humbly, but what happened was I paid attention. I, I paid attention uh, 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 to some, some rappers who did their own distribution deal. And so I said, if the teacher can write it, I can write it. I, he's human just like I'm here. It's a blueprint. I never wrote a book before because my own father wasn't in my life. My father's 60 something, still trying to get a GED. I didn't know who my real father was. I didn't know my grandfather. I didn't have models. So when I went to college and I saw, woo, this guy, you, know, you can write it, I can write a book. We're in the same space. And in less than a year and a half from my garage, me and my team sold over 25,000 copies. No distributor. 25,000 copies. And we made over a million dollars. Some high school dropouts. Guys from the hood. Why? Because somebody gave me the blueprints. Somebody who looked just like me. I'm going to tell you that somebody is. Dr. Ben Carson. Somebody gave me the book. I said, please. I'm not. No, come on. They said, Eric, want you to read. I said, this doctor, this guy got, this doctor, I can't, this, he's a doctor, I'm going to drop out. They said, no, Eric, please read the book. I'm like, I can't, I don't have nothing in common with a neurosurgeon. They said, okay, just do me a favor, read the first couple pages. Blueprints. So I read the first couple pages, I said, ooh, his father left him. Oh, I can read two more pages, this guy, my, my father left me, wow. I kept going, and I read, Dr. Ben Carson, liver noise, Finko. That's Detroit. Dr. Ben Carson, the neurosurgeon, is from the west side of Detroit. His father left him. He's from the west side of Detroit. Okay, I'm going to read a couple more pages. <laughs> Dr. Ben Carson hated school. Ooh, my father <laughs> left me. I'm from Detroit, and I hate school. <laughs> I'm about to read this whole book. <laughs> and I found out Dr. Ben Carson had an anger problem. Listen to me, the reason why it took me 12 years 
to get a four-year degree is because when I went on campus and I saw Pucky, and Pucky was so articulate, and Pucky was so deep, and his father was an alumnus, and his grandfather was an alumnus, the reason why it took me so long to finish, because when I saw Pucky, I said, if that's what you have to be to graduate, then I can't do it. And then Skip graduated. <laughs> and Skip smoked weed almost every day. <laughs> Others will be honest with you. They're going to use his nickname. I'm not going to use his real name. <laughs> Skip party every single night. But guess what? What Skip did for me when he marched, when Equate marched, what it did for me is said, ooh, I can do it. Somebody who's like me and who's from where I'm from, please do me a huge favor as you continue to give and give and give. Don't just give financially. Continue to give your presence. Because when we see you walk in, we say we can do it when we see you. I didn't think I could get a PhD until I saw African American professors who had PhDs and they said to me, young man, if you want it, if you're willing to put forth the effort, we'll show you the blueprint and you can make it happen. And so finally what I need you to do for me, finally, we, we have to teach these young people and I learned it from my grandma. Man, praise God for my grandmother. My grandmother understood the importance of community. Now, this is old school. This is old school. My grandmother was special. First of all, my grandmother understood the importance, and we got to teach these kids the importance of being the best individual you could be. Like, I think grandma might have had a third or fourth grade education, but I'm telling you, grandma, grandma took care of her business. And, and what I love about my grandmother was she made, she made the best food, best cakes, everything grandma did. She put like 120%. I'm talking about like this back in the day, they don't do this anymore. But when grandma made chicken, like she let it sit in buttermilk for like two, two days, old school stuff. They don't have time for that kind of stuff no more. Grandma let it, set, let it soak, right? And grandma would fry it. And the thing I loved about my grandmother, she understood community. And so what my grandmother would do is, every time my grandmother cooked the cake or every time she cooked dinner, grandma would go outside first and make sure that everybody in the community has something to eat. Oh, listen to me. This we got to teach our young people because when I listen to these young people, they're saying, I, 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 um, I, um, I, I, I woke up in a new Bugatti. <laughs> $500,000 vehicle, no house, $500,000 vehicle. It's ignorance. Right? Just everything is self, 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 self centered. And I need us to do, I need you guys to do me a huge favor. I need you guys to teach these kids the importance of community. Now, this is my final one because this is important. When I went to college, there was, there was this mural and it said, Enter to learn, depart to serve. And so every single day they would tell us, when you get your GED, when you get your four-year degree, when you get your master's, when you get your PhD, it's not so you can be elevated. It, it's so when you get there, you can have the tools that you need to go back in the community and make a difference. And so, and so our junior year, we started the GED program. And then when I got to Michigan State, we started the retention program. And then we started a series online called Thank God It's Monday, where every Monday we're giving these kids motivational inspiration. And when I'm with the Lions, they listen to it. When I go to uh, London, we do a piece so they can see what London looks like. So when I'm in, in Jamaica, we shoot it in Jamaica so that they can see. They can physically see somebody. So when people see me, they say, E.T., why the hat? The hat is, so when I'm on campus, kids who walk on that campus who don't see themselves, as soon as they walk on campus and they see the hat, that, we got to connect with that guy right there because that guy understands who we are and where we come from. We, I'm not telling them you don't need to get an education. I'm not telling them you really need to pull your pants up. But what I'm telling them is I've been where you've been, I've done what you've done, and I'm not trying to make it like you can't do it. I'm telling you, you can make it happen. And so we need to teach our children that being blessed doesn't mean everything. Being blessed doesn't mean you, you stand off. Being blessed means that when you are blessed with wealth, when you are blessed with information, when you are blessed with knowledge, you get back. So I love my grandmother because my grandmother made the best case. Because my grandmother showed us what excellence was all about. She went to work every day. My grandmother went to church on a regular basis. My grandmother loved her sons. My grandmother showed me that as an individual, and we have to show them no shortcuts. As individuals, when you go to class, if they're giving out four points, you got to get four points. We have to teach them, listen to me, we have to teach them that they have to live to a level of excellence and that they have to give back. So my final story, we got to teach them the benchmarks. I, I, I'll never forget, I, I'm a different kind of father. I wanted a daughter first, not a son. My grandmother had 14 kids, 11 females. So I was, I was raised by my aunts, and I wanted a daughter. And I remember when I had my son, I was like, man, I wanted a daughter. And my mother said, son, it's called karma. Everything you had done to me, son, is going to come back to you. And she was 100% right. 
I'll never forget, I'll never forget, I, I, I had my daughter sack in the apple of my eye, and I remember going up to the school to pick up my daughter, and, and then and when I picked up my daughter, it was, th th these days they do it different, they're numbers, so my baby is number four. She's about third or fourth grade, and I had my little sign, I pick up number four, please. And they called number four to the front, number four to the front. And I'll never forget, number four came out crying. And number four, listen to me, number four came out crying, God, and I was hurt. I'm thinking some little boy that hit my daughter, I'm about to crucify little man. This is it. This is it. I'm about to take little man out. And my daughter's crying, and she's that old school cry when your grandma whipped you with a switch. That cry that when she whips you, it's so bad that there's no sound. You just like, <laughs> you know the cry I'm talking about. When grandma hits you, and you start crying. Uh, uh, uh. Grandma had a nerve to say, you better stop crying before I give you something to cry about. And I tell grandma, you just gave me something to cry about. And so my daughter had that, she, uh, that I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. And I said, boo, what's wrong? Talk to me. Just If you can't say his name, just point to me. I'll take care of you. And she said, daddy, I'm so sorry. Three, she was in the third or fourth grade, I don't remember. I'm sorry, daddy, I'm sorry. I said, boo, what happened? What's wrong? She said, I got a B in math. I'm thinking somebody about to go to jail because you got to be a man. I'm about to kill one of these little boys. She said, no, daddy, I got my first B. And she was devastated, never had a B in her life. And so she said to me, daddy, you don't understand. I'm not going to be able to get an Eagle Award. I'm just going to get a Patriot Award. And that's A's and B's. I want, daddy, I want all A's. And so I took her home and I told her, look, it's going to be all right. You're going to be fine. And my son walked through the doorway with his report card. Three grades old. He's got his report card. He's excited. Dad, you got to see it. I'm on a football team. I told you I was going to step up. I said, praise God, son. And so he throws his report card down. He's like, Dad, do me a favor. Before you look at this, before you look at this, Dad, promise me we're going out to eat. I said, no problem. Your sister's crying, but let me see your report card. I open up his report card, and I look at his report card, and he has all C's. And he's like, yeah, Dad. I passed every single class, Dad. I said, son, but you got a C minus in English, son. He said, but I got a C plus in gym. That balance all that out, Dad. I'm still on the football team. Oh, listen to me. I mean this. We've got to teach our young people that, at, 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 that as black men, average is not good enough. That, that average is not good enough. As a matter of fact, when we look at our DNA, good ain't good enough. We have to teach them to be great, and we have to teach them to be phenomenal. But guess what? They don't know what greatness is. Many of them have not seen it. Many of them have not seen it in their fathers or their uncles or in their community. They don't see it. If they see it, they see one great in 10 or 11 not so great average. And so I'm asking you, I'm asking you, because you changed me. Without even knowing it, you don't know me, but you changed me. Pastor Willis represents, if he was here, he would be sitting here. Pastor Willis believed in me as I stand here today. I'm saying, wow, he saw something in me when I didn't see it in myself. He believed that this was going to happen to me before I believed it was going to happen to me. He believed London for me. He believed Australia for me. He believed that South Africa, that I would speak in South Africa long before I even knew how to speak. He believed it. He saw it. Do me a favor. When you, when you cannot see it in them, tell them you can see it in them. When you really don't believe, let's say it anyway. And speak the belief into them. Speak the change into them. And show them the model of what they can be. Because if you tell Eric Thomas he can do it, and you show me the way, I'll go from a high school dropout to a PhD candidate and an author. Keep doing what you're doing. God bless. And I thank you so much. Give it up one more time for Eric Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Please. Now, Eric, we have the key to the city here for you. I'm not sure on where it is here, but we have a proclamation from. <laughs> There's all kinds of crazy back here, I promise you. Um, but we have a proclamation for you here, welcoming you here to the city of Hartford. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. I look for a, a long time of work with you and inspiring everybody that we can that walks across our path. So thank you so much. I want to ask this gentleman that have a tie. We wanted to do a passing of the torch. 
Uh, gentlemen who have a tie for these young men, please stand up as we bring these young men here. We want to do a passing of the torch so we can give these young men a tie from these honorees. So young men, if you could come down here and one, you guys could step down and give a tie to a young man. Come on, young men. Please give these young men a, a round of applause. Keep coming down. Please come on down. We wanted to make sure we had a passing on the torch so we could teach these young men how to tie a tie that they can say that they got a tie from these great men who are honored this evening. And next year, we want to make sure that we get wallets for these young men and put a $50 or $100 bill in their wallet and start a bank account for those who do not have a bank account. So this year it's a tie or no tie, so please give it up for these young men. At this time, I'd like to bring up Mr. Greg Devins, who's been chosen as a valedictorian of this inaugural class. Please give it up for Mr. Greg Devins, ladies and gentlemen. Sons of dreamers. 
or the evidence of dreams realized. For those honorees who are like me and like our speaker this evening, we had praying mothers, grandmothers, fathers, or others who believed in us, who believed in our dreams, and who helped us to realize those dreams and become the men that we are today. And perhaps it's coincidental, or maybe divine providence, that a dreamer named June Archer had the foresight, the vision, and yes, the dream, to launch this 100 Men of Color recognition event in the same year that this nation celebrates the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And Martin Luther King Jr., I have a great speech. And you know, a lot of folks like to point to the White House, but I would argue to you that we don't have to solely look to the White House to realize that dreams do, in fact, come true. We have only to look around this room to see men and those that they love and those who stand for our brothers who are no longer with us to realize that there is evidence of the realization of dreams <clears throat> and the dream that people will be judged by the content of their character. And these are all men of character. And the dream really uh, is a reflection of a reality that men of color can and do make positive contributions to our families, our communities, and indeed the nation. So I stand before you as a representative of this impressive group of men who are deeply honored and humbled by this recognition. And for that, we say thank you. the challenge that, that Eric just gave you. So whether you're an honoree, a friend, a loved one, man, woman, boy, or girl, I challenge you this evening to dream big and to run hard to make those dreams a reality. We need more dreamers in this world. We need more people who will encourage our youth to dream big and to work hard. Um, I have been given the honor to honor someone who has honored other people. Just, just think of that. Honoring someone who honors, who honors others. That's an incredible nuclear reaction of sorts that really unleashes the power of the spirit and the power of humanity. So on behalf of 100 Men of Color, um, I would like to present this to uh, Mr. June, Ar to June Archer. Um, <laughs> giving generously of his time, commitment, and talents uh, to his community. That was a part of the program. <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate this. I, I'm not deserving. I, these are my mentors, like I said, and I really thank you guys for it instilling everything. And I actually, I'm not certain if I worked at Cigna, but I did stay in the uh, Holiday Inn. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you guys, I appreciate it. I want to say um, this night would not be possible without a few people. I have to mention them really quickly. First of all, I have to thank my, my wife. She's the beautiful one over there on the wall right there. Thank you so much. My team, uh, Christopher Wright from the Wright Design Group. Uh, Tyrese uh, Bolden outside with the rest of our uh, volunteers helping out. And Miss Clancy Victor, please. Do it up for all of them. Um, a special thank you to our sponsors, uh, to Travelers for sponsoring this award ceremony. We thank you. PCC Technology Group. The Right Design Group, The Cloud Company, Aetna, The Red Flowers Foundation, Dr. Richard Ruffin. Um, we have our friends of men of color, uh, Keith Clater, Edward Forte, uh, Glenn and Millicent Gill, Cecil and Toby Hudson, Brandon McGee Jr., uh, Mass Mutual Tax Plus, and Ms. Madison Wright. We have our media sponsors. And uh, a list of them here, Central Connecticut State University, Bushnell, um, Central Connecticut State University, sorry, Hot 93.7, 
uh, DH Bolton, and, um, the Hearts Foundation at Bionic and YBC. So you can see that, and also thank you to the Connecticut Science Center for having us here. So, Mayor, you want to take these, and now we'll announce everyone. Awardees, are you ready? Honorees, are you ready? <coughs> Detective Fred Abrams. <laughs> Mr. Robert Okuko. These men are getting also a pin from the state of Connecticut as well, so that's what they're getting. Uh, we have Julian Alexander, who could not be here this evening. We'll accept it on his behalf. Mr. Yvonne Alexander. <laughs> Kyle Anderson, Sr. Michael Ansara, better known as MG. Congratulations, sir. This is a gentleman who got me into Central Connecticut State University, so. Thank you, sir. One of my fathers, Mr. Floyd Bagwell, Sr. Accepting on behalf of Archbishop Leroy Bailey III is uh, Reverend Bailey, Jr. <laughs> Posthumously, we are, well, are honoring Mr. Colin Bennett and his wife is here. Mr. Colin Bennett. Are you here? She's right here. Oh, okay. We'll get it up to you. We'll get it up to you. Mr. Kenneth Bennett, Sr. Mr. Keith L. Carr, Sr. And taking his award is Mr. Keith Carr, Jr. <laughs> Reverend Bruce Carter. <laughs> Mr. Edwin Carty. Chief Luis Casanova.
It's actually great to have a father and son here for the inaugural class. Please give it up for Mr. Sanford Cloud Jr. Senator Eric Coleman. <laughs> Timothy Collins, AKA DJ Buck. <laughs> Posthumously, the Reverend Dr. Lincoln Davis, Sr. And Mrs. Davis Gibbon. Greg E. Devins. Scott X. Estelle. Happy anniversary, sir. <laughs> Mr. Tom Ficklin. I think I saw him, so we keep going. Mr. Glenn Fields. He couldn't be here this evening, but please give it up for Mr. Glenn Fields. <laughs> Jason Gill. Samuel Gray, Jr. <laughs> Floyd Green. Dr. David Grice. Anthony Griffin. Josh Hall. Clinton Hamilton. Peter Higgins. Chief Emery Hightower. Chandler Howard. <laughs> Cecil Hudson. <laughs> Mr. Walter Doc Hurley. Everyone give it up for Doc Hurley right there, ladies and gentlemen. Love you, Doc. Thank you for coming.
Yes, sir. <laughs> Kevin Joyner. <laughs> Doc, you look sharp too, man. <laughs> Borrow that blazer. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Not that Michael Jordan. The, the light skinned Michael Jordan. <laughs> I felt so tall for a moment. Now this gentleman, we go back to like first grade, so it gives me an honor to, to mention this gentleman here. Because he's done some great things. And he when I told him about this event, um, this is really quickly, I told him the reason why it's important to do this event because Doc Hurley has been a light and a pillar in the, in the community. You are the next Doc Hurley. But who are you going to inspire to be the next Kevin Kirksey? Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kevin Kirksey. It would take him to wear a white blazer. This guy. This has been since first grade, I'm telling you this. Sergeant William Kittle. How many state troopers are here who represent Sergeant Kittle here? Congratulations. Constable Victor Luna Jr. We should do a party together, the black and brown party. We gotta do something here. We haven't done that yet. Dr. Aaron Lewis. My motivation, my uh, mentor, uncle, one of my biggest supporters, the reason why I chose the road of being an entrepreneur, my uncle, Mr. Jerry Long. Yes, I need that tux too. Mr. Douglas McCory. We talk about having a mentee-mentor relationship. I've known this young man since he chose me to be his mentor almost 13 years ago. And now he is a state representative. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me honor to honor Brandon McGee Jr. Alfonso McGriff the third. Jimmy McMichael. Every time I talk to this young man, I always have to say his whole name, but I'm going to take a step further. 
Mr. Dennis Mink. Standing six five. <laughs> Power forward. <laughs> Sergeant Cleon Moses. Daryl Moss. And I believe someone's here to take this, but we have John Motley who couldn't be here this evening, but this is for Mr. John Motley. Abdul Muhammad. Aaron Nazario. Another mentor and good friend, Mr. Dr. Steve Perry. It's not a McDonald's 365 award, this is a 100 meter color award. Tony Petaway. Mr. Cyril Passad. Ruffin. We talk about hospitality entertainment. This is where it started with me, Mr. Hugh Russell. Some of us just call him Teddy. <laughs> Sam Saylor. <laughs> Dr. Michael Sharp. <laughs> Stan Simpson. Smith. Bernard Thomas. Lionel Thompson Jr. Posthumously honoring Mr. Richard Weaver Bay is Terrence Weaver Bay. <laughs> A special shout out to Mr. Weaver Bay. It was his, his birthday this week, so he's truly missed. Michael Williams. <laughs> Stanley Stack Williams. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, 
Mr. Joe Young. We have one here. I'm not certain if if any of the Anne Marie Lewis or T.T. Lewis is here, but we have one for, and he's truly missed as well, Sebastian Lewis, a.k.a. Subby, from Fat Hats. So I'm not certain if they're here, except on his behalf, but this is for Sebastian Lewis. several uh, citations and proclamations. Uh, the first one is uh, signed by the President Pro Tempore, uh, Donald Williams, and the Speaker of the House, Brandon Sharkey. Uh, be, here, be it hereby known that the Connecticut General Assembly uh, hereby offers a sincere congratulations to Eric D. Thomas in recognition of 100 Men of Color's keynote speaker. Um, so this is for Mr. Official citation, uh, be it known uh, to all that the Connecticut General Assembly hereby offers a sincere congratulations to June Archer, 100 Men of Color recognition of the entire membership extends its very best wishes on this uh, memorable occasion. Please give it up for Miss Lynette Cardi. Shantice Marshall Shepard, or Shepard Marshall. And our keynote speaker, Mr. Eric Thomas. I thank you all for coming so much. Please go out and have a great time. Tell everybody you had a good time. If you're taking pictures or you're tweeting, please hashtag 100 Men of Color. Thank you so much. God bless you. Good night.